class is going to be devoted to studying Hegel's philosophy of right, which was the last of his books to come out in a not yet revised form. He did follow it with revisions of several of his previous books. And is perhaps his most influential work. There's some who have said that the climactic battle of World War II, the Battle of Stalingrad, was a conflict pitting the Hegelian left against the Hegelian right. I think we're going to see to what degree that characterization is specious like so many other characterizations of Hegel. But nevertheless, I think you're going to, to find that the work we're dealing with is in many respects a culmination of the philosophical tradition in which we find ourselves, in that it brings to resolution problems that have haunted ethics from its beginnings in the tradition that has come to uh, become the dominant tradition of human civilization. And I think we're going to find that Hegel is going to provide us with the resources we need to do ethics without compromise, do ethics in a way that can fend off the challenge of nihilism. And in doing so, I think we're going to find that Hegel's work gives us the resources we need for both understanding the nature of the modern world and for being able to properly evaluate it. Now, the work we're looking at, as I mentioned, is really the fourth book that Hegel writes. Um, his first book is published in 1807 when he was 37. It's called The Phenomenology of Spirit. It's followed by his Science of Logic, which he publishes in several installments starting in 1812 through 1817. And then he publishes a work called The Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, which is a chapbook for his university lectures. It sort of presents an outline the entirety of the philosophical system that he is going to be presenting in his courses, where unlike most so-called philosophy professors, when he's teaching, first as a high school teacher, then as a university teacher, he deals with all the areas of philosophical investigation. But he does so by providing his own philosophical answers to address all of these areas. And he works on all of these areas, one might say simultaneously over the course of his career, starting as his day, in his days as a high school teacher, who either had unusually precocious students or was oblivious to what the students may or may not be, have been getting from him. But late in his career, in 18. 21. Of course, he's writing this in the 18, 1820, 11 years before he dies. He decides to publish a more expanded version of that section of his philosophical encyclopedia that covers what here is presented independently as the philosophy of right, or as our translator characterizes it, elements of the philosophy of right. Now, I mentioned um, this succession as well as the placement of this work in Hegel's corpus because we're going to have to confront that and contend with it. I mean, Hegel was aware, as I think all great philosophers were, that you can't just do ethics on its own, that you can't treat philosophy as if it were a specialist discipline where one could simply choose to take up a particular area and address it seriously. One couldn't, it would make no sense to do what today is expected of those who are entering the profession of, well, if not being philosophers, at least teaching philosophy, of having an area of specialty. Needless to say, Hegel had no more any areas of specialty than Plato or Aristotle or Descartes or any of the great philosophers. <coughs> 
and this was not a, a matter of historical accidents, not representative of the fact that they all had a certain kind of classical education. It was more that they all recognized that in order to deal systematically with ethics, there was much else that one had to deal with and deal with beforehand in order to be in a position to speak authoritatively about the domain of conduct. Nevertheless, I am asking you to look at Hegel's philosophy of right and concentrate on his philosophy of right. And in doing so, we will have to, in some respect, pay heed to what, systematically speaking, are the prior theor the theoretical labors that have to be engaged in to really be able to first engage in an investigation of ethics. And secondly, to take note of how Hegel himself thought these prior labors had to be engaged in. And we will, to some degree, address uh, those issues. But what I want to do today is to, to, to first address the very question of whether or not this work called The Philosophy of Right is a work of ethics. Because there are many who have looked upon it and questioned whether Hegel has anything to say about what might be considered normative matters, concerns with what ought to be, concerns with what is right or wrong. And in a sense, there, there are several principal reasons why some people are skeptical that Hegel has anything that could be considered in ethics. And there are reasons for this that have to do with the very way in which he operates and also with regard to certain discussions and remarks he makes in the preface to this work, as well as certain considerations he engages in towards the very end of the work. And I, I just want to point to these and uh, some of the perplexities they raise uh, to sort of clear the way for turning to Hegel's work and understanding in what respect it is a work of ethics and perhaps a culmination of ethical investigation. Now, one of the reasons why there is much skepticism regarding whether this work is something that has any normative character is that Hegel simply presents us with a conception of the reality of freedom, the reality of self-determination. The philosophy of right is going to consist of an account of what the actuality of self-determination is. And that account is going to turn out to involve a system of structures of self-determination. And what, in a sense, will distinguish Hegel's account from all others is that self-determination is going to be conceived from beginning to end as involving what might be considered structures of interaction, structures of interaction of a plurality of selves. That is, although Hegel will speak about there being a plurality of different types of forms of self-determination, each involving certain types of agency, involving certain types of ends, certain types of means and instruments of the operation of those ends, that distinguish them from other modes, that all are going to involve relations between agents, rather than the exercise of an individual self acting independently of the actions of others. Now, as I mentioned, Hegel is simply going to give us that account. He's going to start by thinking through what we might consider or what he will present in a way as a system of self-determination. And it will be a system in the sense that, as we're going to see, it's going to involve a plurality of practices and associations that are going to form a whole that is itself presided over by a particular type of self-determination that will unify all the different modes and provide for their realization as well as its own. The capstone of the system is ultimately going to be political self-determination. But what will be completely absent in Hegel's account, in contrast to one might say all prior, uh, well, 
ethical investigations is that there is no separate argument provided to legitimate or validate these structures or provide authority to these structures. That is, Hegel is not going to invoke any independently given criteria or standards by which to confer legitimacy or validity upon these structures of self-determination. Nor is he going to make appeal to any prior process, procedures, or development which will confer validity, normativity upon the structures of self-determination. In some respect, you know, this represents a departure from what is presumed to be, well, what passes for, for legitimation or validation or argument, namely what is going to be shown to be valid in the domain of right, what is shown to be in the domain of conduct, what is shown to be right or just and so forth would seem to be the provision of some reasons, something that can count as a reason or a principle that can validate what it is that has legitimacy. Yeah, there's always an appeal to something that could be considered a foundation of normativity, the foundation of validity. It might be a privileged content that will have to be realized or embodied in that which is to count as valid or it could be some privileged determiner, which is such that whatever it determines, whatever it gives rise of, counts. No matter what its content is, what makes it valid is that it emerges from some privileged source. Well, none of that is to be found in Hegel's account. What he offers us has no normative foundations. It does not rest upon anything that has any normative character. It does not derive its legitimacy from any other factor or any other independent factor or underlying ground or independent authority. And the absence of the traditional resources that are invoked in, well, any kind of normative investigation, whether it be concerned with validating knowledge claims, validating conduct, validating aesthetic pretensions of beauty. Um, all of those efforts that think about normativity in terms of something that is conferred by some foundation, be it some privileged content or some privileged determiner, all of this is absent in Hegel's consideration. And the absence of what would otherwise pass as a kind of validating argument has led some to think that, well, Hegel is not offering us anything that has normative validity. He's not offering us something that has any prescriptive character. He's giving us something that could be said to be merely descriptive. Now, one of the obvious facts about the efforts of philosophers in thinking about convention, in thinking about everything that can be said to be a reality of willing, everything that owes its existence to decisions taken by agents, everything that could be said to arise in history, everything that could be said to have any cultural reality. Well, in a, in a certain respect, Philosophers who depend upon reason, and reason alone, to arrive at the truth of their subject matter, philosophers never, at least philosophers worthy of being taken seriously, never, ever attempt to conceive what convention is. And by convention, I'm speaking about all of those realities that could be spoken of as consisting in the activities, the purpose of activities the responsible activities of individuals, individuals in their plurality, let alone in their singularity. 
You don't find philosophers telling us, using reason alone, what the family is, what property is, what society is, what the state is. They don't because, after all, these are associations that come to be through acts of will. What form they take is contingent. Which is why, in their existence, as in a sense, things that come about in history, they take manifold forms. They take forms that vary from place to place, from time to time. And if you confront that fact that there's something inherently arbitrary about their existence, there's no way one can simply think, think as a philosopher does, in independence of observation, and be able to say with any necessity what is when it comes to any type of association. And given the inherent contingency and arbitrariness of institutions, of conventions. There's no way one can come up with any authoritative categorization of them in a purely descriptive way. Because you're stuck having to deal with observation and you know, empirical investigation. Which as such can never uncover anything that is strictly necessary or universal. Any kind of groupings one selects among the data are at best provisional in character. they are family resemblances, where where one sets up one boundaries is what falls into this, this array of what one calls, for example, the political, as opposed to the social, as opposed to familial, are in a sense just based upon, well, commonalities one happens to find, for which one can also find, always find well, so to speak, exceptions that require one to revise how one draws these lines, which never have any automatic necessity or universality. Nevertheless, of course, philosophers do address the political, the social, the household, and various other things, and cultural manifestations such as religion and art and the like. But in a certain respect, they're doing so in terms of, in a way, what they ought to be. And certainly with regard to the conventions of practice, if they're conceiving the state, it's, it's not the state as it is, but the state as it ought to be, the just state, or the just society. And having conceived these normative institutions, they're then in a position to conceive what would be various kinds of defective forms of a state that could be regarded as something that either lies in the path of the degeneration of the just state, or perhaps on the pathway of what it would mean to establish valid institutions. Now Hegel is conceiving the institutions of freedom. He's conceiving self-determination. It's going to involve a system of institutions of certain kinds and the like. And yet, again, one might wonder, is there something prescriptive going on? Because Besides the fact that Hegel provides none of the traditional types of legitimations that ethicists have turned to in the past, he also makes various remarks in the preface that might make one wonder whether what he's provided, providing is something that is prescriptive and normative in character. And among those remarks, are somewhere Hegel will, for example, make these notorious claims that, well, to begin with, the actual is rational and the rational is actual, which makes one presume that in some respect, if Hegel is dealing with what can be thought with regard to conduct by using reason alone, He's in some regard describing what is, which would appear to be something faulty. How can the actuality of conduct, given that conduct is something conventional, given that conduct consists in the coordinated actions of individuals possibly have any strictly universal character? Isn't it prey to all sorts of contingencies and arbitrary, arbitrarinesses 
uh, that are reflected in the very way in which history offers us this cornucopia of different forms that come and go uh, here and there in the past and undoubtedly in the future as well. Well, I think we're going to see that you have to take with a grain of salt what, it, what Hegel means when he speaks about actuality. Actuality is something that people will speak about in his science of logic as, as a term that is to be distinguished from existence, is to be distinguished from reality, all of which have very specific kinds of logical determinations. Um, I'm not going to say anything yet about how these are going to be distinguished, but one thing to, to, to keep in mind is that when Hegel makes these kind of claims, they don't necessarily signify that the given, as given, is rational. And that, that therefore, if we're talking about, in a sense, the reality of freedom, we're talking about something that is merely given and devoid of any normative character. Now, the, sec the second point that comes up often in the, in the preface is that Hegel will criticize that point of view that regards ethics as being a discipline which, in a sense, has something to teach. Something to teach institutions. That is, in a sense, is, is concerned with providing us with an ought to be that is distinct from what is. And he regards there being something inherently faulty as regarding ethics as engaged in that attempt to, in a sense, prescribe something that is completely detached from what we find given, and thereby um, puts ethics in the position of, shall we say, imposing designs upon the present without regard for the character of the present. Now again, we'll want to see what uh, what uh, this really signifies. At face value, it might appear that Hegel is abandoning any prescriptive character for any talk about institutions, that somehow we are rooted with the given, and that somehow our thinking cannot free itself from the present. And in fact, Hegel will make further remarks in the present, in the preface to the effect that, well, philosophy is to some respect always caught within its epic and can only, in some respect, think that which is coming to fruition in its own time. And anyone who thinks otherwise is, is, is deluded. Now, of course, if you take this view seriously, at face value, it would seem to suggest that all our thinking is historically relative, that thinking, thought, is historicist in character, meaning that all thinking is relative to the historical period in which it finds itself. Now that is a prevalent view, and some want to ascribe it to Hegel. Um, but you know, such a view is obviously fundamentally flawed. I mean, what is the problem with historicism if it's presented in this, in this sort of unconditioned way, this global assertion? that all thought is historically conditioned, that all thought is, in some respect, bound to its time. And that conclusion is also so relative. That's right. I mean, here you're making a claim about theory in general. And yet, if it's going to be a claim about theory in general that holds unconditionally, because you're offering it as, a, as an unqualified claim, you're saying this is, the, this is the, in a sense, diagnosis that applies to theorizing per se. It's always beholden to its time. It's always contingent and relative to its epoch. Well, clearly one is offering something that violates the very diagnosis being offered. Because one is making a global, supra-historical claim that applies to all periods, to thought in any context whatsoever, and is offered with a kind of unconditioned authority. So such a view, in a way, is hard to take seriously. And one, one might wonder, well, Hegel seems in certain respects to be offering something that seems to have aspects of that. 
And I think you'll, you'll see later on that when Hegel is speaking about the deficiency of treating ethics as if it were offering prescriptions that could be offered as concerning something that ought to be with no connection to what is, that that has two sides to it. One of it will often be directed at the kind of ethics offered by Kantian theory, which is Hegel will show at various junctures in, in the work that we are going to be looking at. will show that Kantian ethics is such that the way it conceives what is normative or what is right in conduct is such that it can't be realized that it is only something that ought to be. That the way the ethical is construed in Kantian terms is such that it can't possibly be actualized. And an ethics that conceives of what is normative, of what ought to be in such a way that it is only it ought to be, is fundamentally flawed. Another side of this that Hegel will point to later in the work and I want to put it before you now because it has some bearing upon these remarks in the preface. It's, it's something that he directs at Napoleon. And he could have directed it perhaps against George Bush. Maybe he might have directed it at George Marshall after the Second World War. Um, and I, but I think it's, it, it's something that has, um, well, we have to think of the historical examples with, with a certain degree of nuance. But, but the, the claim being made, or the, shall we say, the critique that Hegel wields against Napoleon, is that Napoleon attempts to impose a constitution upon the nation, Spain in particular, that he conquers, and presumes that one can treat what is normative, right, the Napoleonic Code, in a sense, the fundamentally modern institutions of personhood and the like that Napoleon is imposing upon Europe, overthrowing all of the old feudal relationships and clerical relationships and so forth. Well, Hegel points out that in a certain respect, one cannot impose a, com a constitution upon a community externally. Or that in a certain respect, the political act of founding a state is not something that can, can possibly achieve its ends because of the very nature of, in some respect, one could say the institutions of freedom. And the key to this will be that the institutions of political freedom cannot be realized unless other institutional transformations have already taken place which are not susceptible of any direct political manipulation. Transformations that have to do with society, that have to do with the household, that have to do with religion, and that are fundamentally resistant to the imposition of ethical designs that are presented as an ought to be, that in some way are not rooted in the actual fabric of that in which they are to be embodied. And none of this precludes that there is an ethics that has a normative character. But somehow the ethical is going to be tied to something that is actualizable. And it has an actuality that is going to be tied to a variety of different types of institutions. Now, in In regard to these remarks that you encounter in the preface, and I suggest you read it if you haven't already, Hegel, at the very end of the philosophy of right, presents us with a discussion of history. And Hegel, as I, I mentioned earlier, spent his entire teaching career, first as a high school teacher, gymnasium teacher, and then as a college teacher, lecturing on all areas of philosophy, and one of which was lecturing on history in a philosophical manner. And these lectures on the philosophy of history were 
collected by students of Hegel after his death, and they had taken some kind of verbatim notes, and these were then published in various forms. Uh, there continues to be an industry of people who are locating these student notebooks and going through them, publishing them. They had been more or less put together in the original collected works of Hegel that were published sometime after his death by his students, some of the students. Um, but you have his lectures on the philosophy of history, lectures on the philosophy of religion, lectures on the history of philosophy, lectures on the philosophy of nature, lectures on the philosophy of mind, all of which are voluminous writings that make up really the bulk of Hegel's works. Because as I mentioned, Hegel himself published basically four books, The Phenomenology of Spirit, The Science of Logic, The Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, and The Philosophy of Right. Well, in the lectures on the philosophy of history, it appears that Hegel is providing us with a descriptive philosophy of history. That is, he seems to be providing us with, or some people think he's providing us with, an a priori account of what necessarily happens in history. And of course, that sort of leads to the implication that human institutions, the institutions of conduct, are subject to a necessity, which might also appear to rob them of any possible normativity. How could we be fully responsible for them if they are, in a sense, necessitated by some unfolding process? Now, given the very character of convention, it seems ludicrous to think that there can be a descriptive philosophy of history. And interestingly enough, in the lectures on the philosophy of history, Hegel begins at some point by, by making a, an announcement more or less as follows. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present to you a, a historical judgment. It's not a philosophical claim. It's based upon observation. And what I'm going to observe, and claim to have observed, is that in our day, the day of modern times, the institutions of freedom are coming into existence. And we see them coming into existence through the revolutions that have swept France, the United States, the religious, in a sense, transformations that have occurred in the aftermath of the Reformation, the social upheavals that are occurring, uh, perhaps in their most extreme form in England, through the Industrial Revolution, that all of these features that are, in a sense, beginning to turn the world upside down, not just in Europe, but in every corner of the globe, that these transformations are, in effect, putting on the agenda, on a global scale, coming to be of the different institutions of freedom, involving transformations of property relations, transformations of moral accountability, transformations of the household, transformations of society, transformations of the political domain. This is a fact that we can observe. On the basis of this empirical observation, which is not something of which we can ever have any of the kind of absolute certainty that philosophical argument can provide us, we can then engage in a kind of philosophically informed historical reflection where we look back over the historical record and interpret it as a development in which we see the genesis of the institutions of freedom. Now in the philosophy of right, Hegel ends by providing us with a history. The history is something that is presented after he has laid out what the institutions of freedom are. Those institutions of freedom are presented, as we'll see, as being what alone can be legitimate, can have normativity. Normativity, as we're going to see, is going to be identified with nothing other than the reality of self-determination. Once we have laid out and thought through what the reality of self-determination is in its entirety, we are then in a position 
to try to think through a philosophically informed history, which is not descriptive in character, but prescriptive. It's going to be a history of what must occur for the institutions of freedom to come to be. And we have the resources to think that out, because on the one hand, we, having worked through the philosophy of right, have at our disposal what are the normative institutions, what are the structures of self-determination. And we also, through the philosophical labors that provide us with the prerequisites of conduct, philosophical labors that allow us to account for nature, the psychology of selves, everything that allows individuals to exist in their plurality and be in a position to engage in conventions and to make history. Well, we can take that, that as, in a sense, the starting point, out of which we can then think of what has to occur in order for the institutions of freedom to come to be. So in this respect, there is going to be a place for a history that is not going to involve a subscription to what Hegel is ordinarily associated with, namely a descriptive philosophy of history involving claims to the effect that reason can show that what happens must be of such a character. But alas, the institutions of freedom can always be overthrown. The development out of which such institutions right, might arise could always be obliterated, not only by human decisions, but by natural catastrophes. Just as whatever institutions of freedom we may establish, which may linger on, are bound to be incinerated when our sun begins dying out and expands and uh, expands beyond the borders of our planet. And uh, well, right, there's, there's, we're not in a position to say anything descriptive about right, the fate of what is normative. Now, I want to give you, in perhaps the most extreme nutshell, the kind of considerations that might allow us to understand why it could be that Hegel would offer us what could be considered the culmination of ethics by presenting us with something that consists in nothing other than conceiving the reality of self-determination without any normative preliminaries, without any appeals to privileged contents that are the criteria that tell us, in a sense, what has to be embodied for conduct to be valid, or any procedures like social contract that are going to produce that which has normativity because they've arisen from a particular kind of uh, engagement. Well, I'll, I'll give you in a nutshell um, the most rudimentary kind of argument, which we are then going to look back at and explore in greater detail um, next time, and where I'll try to supply for you uh, something I discussed, by the way, in the readings in, in the Just State, in the introduction to that book. Some considerations of how one can understand how thinking of what is normative as being nothing other than the reality of self-determination resolves the problems that afflict ethics so long as it makes appeal to foundations of any sort. So let me just put before you this basic notion, which in a way is a standard view of justification in all domains. Remember, we can think about justification applying to knowledge, we can think of it applying to conduct, we can think of it applying to aesthetic worth. And ordinarily, something is justified to the extent that it derives its validity from something else. There's some reason for it being true, or good, or beautiful. And that reason, in a sense, confers validity upon that which is valid. It, in a sense, is the foundation for the validity, the legitimacy, the normativity of what possesses validity. Right? That is the standard trope. 
right? What is valid or what is just or what is right in the domain of conduct is right because it has its legitimacy conferred upon it by something that is the foundation of legitimacy. In a sense, its validity or its normative value is determined by something distinct from itself. We need to appeal to something distinct from itself to validate it and certify that it's what it ought to be. Well, obviously, the question arises, what about the authority of the foundation? What gives it its privileged role? Because on its very own terms, what has authority is what derives from this privilege factor, from this foundation. What is determined by this foundation is what counts as valid. So on its very own terms of being a foundation of normative validity, this foundation can only have validity on its own terms if what is true. If it is founded upon itself, if it grounds itself, if it derives its authority from itself. But if that's the case, it has a validity that is self-grounded or self-determined. And if its validity consists in being self-determined, the only way it can have the validity that it has to have, given its role as a foundation, is if it eliminates the distinction on which foundational justification rests. That is the distinction between what confers validity and what possesses validity. Because what confers validity only has a right to confer validity if it confers validity upon itself. Because the way in which justification operates on the basis of a foundation is that what counts is what is determined by the foundation. The foundation itself can't count unless it's determined by itself. But in that case, it is driven to eliminate the difference between what confers legitimacy and what possesses legitimacy. So when foundational justification is called upon to become consistent, to become internally consistent, it is compelled to undermine the distinction between what confers validity and what possesses validity. And in eliminating that distinction, it ends up leaving us with normativity being equivalent to self-determination. And if you want to run away from that and say, no, we're going to make appeal to some further standard, the moment you do that, the same compulsion enters in. So long as you consider normativity to be heteronymous, that is to be, to say, where the validity of something resides in something different from itself, where its validity is determined by something different from itself, where its validity is not something autonomous, but heteronymous, dependent upon something other. That on which its validity depends can only be valid if it somehow depends upon itself. And once again, there's no escape from having to, in a sense, recognize that the only normativity that can avoid self-referential inconsistency is a normativity that consists in self-determination. Now, Hegel is not going to really present this argument for us, but I think we're going to be able to see, and I'll be laying this out in more detail next time regarding the different fundamental options of ethics, that this is what allows him to regard ethics as not being a science of the highest good, of not being a science of procedural construction, of not being a social contract theory, but of being nothing other than a theory of the reality of self-determination. Now, I mentioned that Hegel is going to be presenting us 
with the theory of the reality of self-determination. Well, in a certain respect, we'll give this theory a certain kind of descriptive power. Is an empirical judgment I referred to earlier. Namely, if modern times are distinguished by developments in which the institutions of freedom are beginning to emerge through all sorts of conflicts whose final outcome, in a certain respect, can never be final. Well, nevertheless, that would mean that this normative theory can have a descriptive power. It can tell us something about the nature of what is to the extent that what is, is in certain respects what ought to be. Of course, it can also have a critical power in giving us an insight in what dimensions of what is have not yet fully worked out what it is to actualize self-determination in all of its dimensions. Now Hegel's philosophy of right you know, is presented to us expressly, as he says in the, in the preface, as something that is going to expand upon the chapbook that is his encyclopedia of the philosophical sciences, which his students would buy um, and look up in conjunction with his lectures. He's going to provide more of an argument. Now what I think, well, what I'm going to argue for, and I, we'll see whether you, you can uh, find this palatable, is that Hegel is going to work out the general structure that self-determination does indeed have. But that, when he comes to de detailing certain forms of self-determination, he's going to fail to work them out as he ought to, given his own scruples. And that to some degree his failure to do so reflects, in a way, his inability to free himself entirely from aspects of prevailing institutions of his day, um, which nevertheless he provides the resources to thoroughly critique. So in a sense, that puts us in the position of, on the one hand, thinking through the fundamental project he's working on, and on the other hand, being critical of the, the extent to which he succeeds in working it out properly. And we're going to be looking at that aspect. I'm going to demand it. Why not demand it? Well, I can't force you to do anything, but I am going to be asking you to consider my own efforts to do what Hegel ought to have done. And I might add that you're going to find that when Hegel is working out the structures of self-determination, he's going to argue, and we're going to look at this in some detail and, and examine what is compelling about it, or perhaps not compelling about it. He's going to argue, in a sense, that first of all, there is a kind of necessary development in how one thinks through the institutions of self-determination. As he says in the preface, you know, the, the nature of philosophical investigation in general is such that the content is not arbitrarily ordered. Nor is the order of the investigation something given apart from the content. You know, formal logic, which is shoved down your throats by some of my colleagues in most of the philosophy departments in the world, you know, presumes that somehow or other thought is something that has a character given independently of its content. But Hegel's going to maintain that in a way the organization of the material is bound up with its content. And we're going to see how that's going to play itself out, that somehow structurally the institutions of freedom are such that certain forms of freedom have to be at hand before others can be what they are. Because in a sense, they provide prerequisite ingredients. And the most minimal form of freedom Hegel is going to present is what he calls abstract right, which consists of a form of self-determination where individuals determine themselves as owners. And that is going to turn out to be something one can do only by interacting with others. You cannot be an owner as a hermit or as a last inhabitant on a desert island. You can only determine yourself as an owner 
by interacting with others who are engaged in determining themselves as owners. Hegel is going to present this as being, in a sense, the most minimal form of self-determination that must be at hand before individuals can exercise any other form of self-determination. And he will follow that with an account of what he will characterize as morality, a type of self-determination where individuals once again interact with one another in such a way that they hold each other accountable for acting with the right purposes and intentions where they themselves are responsible for determining what right purposes and intentions are. And on the basis of that, Hegel will then present what he calls ethical community, Zittlichkeit, which is sometimes translated as ethical life. And Zittlichkeit will involve three different spheres. One will be a family, understood as a certain form of a certain kind of association, self-determination, then a civil society, which will involve a certain kind of self-determination, which will then all be encompassed within a body politic, consisting of the institutions of political self-determination. It's these three spheres of ethical community that are going to be where we find Hegel in some respect, violating the integrity of his own argument and proving to be unable to divorce himself from certain aspects of the life of his day. And it will be our task to try to work these things out in a, in a more coherent way. Now, I mentioned that Hegel's attempt to present ethics as the reality of self-determination is something that, in a sense, invokes no normative foundations. That does not mean that self-determination has no prerequisites or preconditions. That is, one cannot engage in self-determination. If there isn't a world, a world that contains animals and contains animals of a certain kind, that are able to make choices and indeed to speak and think. And we're going to see in what respect these conditions have to be at hand in order for there to be agents who can determine themselves, who can engage in self-determination. What's important to note is that these enabling conditions, these enabling conditions have no normative role to play. Or another way of putting it, that they in no way provide us with any basis for discriminating between what conduct is right and what conduct is wrong. And there's a simple reason for this. These enabling conditions make conduct in general possible, be it right or wrong. And it's important to see this because the same thing will apply to questions of knowledge. For example, one can I mean, obviously point to all sorts of enabling conditions without which one couldn't engage in any kind of cognition. There has to be nature. We better be on a planet that is not too close to a sun. There better be certain kinds of molecules available to make life possible. There better be a certain degree of nourishment and food, right? There would be all sorts of things without which one can't involve in cognition. But the point is, none of these enabling conditions, including language, which provides us with words and the ability to express thoughts, without which we can't have any conceptual knowing whatsoever, none of these enabling conditions could possibly have any impact upon what makes our knowledge true or false. Why? Well, once again, because they are the enabling conditions of all knowledge claims we make, no matter what they are. So precisely because of that, they're indifferent to what it is that distinguishes false from true claims, just as the enabling conditions of conduct are indifferent to what distinguishes the choices they make possible, um, those that are right or wrong. Now, let me just point one other thing regarding the, the, the working question we're about to consider. It's called the philosophy of right. Right in German, effect, has various meanings. But one significance I want to 
put before you that we need to explore is to think of right in regard to rights. Rights. Because what I think we're going to find is that self-determination is going to involve rights. And that self-determination is going to involve rights precisely because of the way in which self-determination is something that cannot be engaged in by a single individual in isolation, but can only be engaged in, in an interrelationship of individuals, where each can only determine itself insofar as it relates to others who are determining themselves. And when we're talking about rights, we're talking about something of that sort. I think you get a grasp of this if you recognize that rights are distinct from privileges. Right? Privileges could be said to be uh, prerogatives that some or one has and not everyone else. But rights involve an area of discretion that could be said to be universal to all agents. All agents have rights to the extent that they all have, shall we say, an entitled area within which they are free to exercise a mode of choosing that is of such a character that all other individuals can engage in that same mode of choosing without preventing others from doing that and, in a sense, enabling them to do that. And that is indicative of how when we're talking about rights, there's something else that goes hand in hand with rights. If rights are not privileges, then in exercising one's right, one also is going to be involved with doing what else? One's duty. One's duty. One's duty to do what? Respect the other right. Exactly, to respect the rights of others. So every structure of right, as involving rights, is going to involve a respect for the same, one could say, limited range of choice to which one is entitled that is equally going to be something that one is going to regard others to be entitled to and to respect that. And indeed, the domain within which one is entitled or has the right to act will be such that it will not conflict with the domain of others. Because if it did conflict, it would be a privilege, not a right. It's going to be, in a sense, a mode of choosing that is going to be inherently connected to or mediated by the exercise by others of that same domain of choice, that same prerogative. So the, the exercise of rights are all going to involve duties to respect the rights of others. Now, we want to understand in what respect self-determination is going to have anything to do with rights and plurality, and why self-determination cannot be thought of, as it typically is, as being something that a single individual is going to engage in. Now, Hegel is not going to deny, we're going to, we're going to encounter this in due course, he's not going to deny that freedom, understood as self-determination, requires that individuals have a choosing self. That individuals have a natural character that is not determined by their willing. He does not require that? No, he, he is going to, he to okay. grant that. Right? That one cannot engage in self-determination unless one has a self that has a natural character and dimension. In other words, has, has features that are not the product of its willing, but enable it to engage in willing in the first place. And in that regard, the very faculty of choice can be regarded as something that is a kind of natural volition that is not self-determined. It's not self-determined because its character is not the product of willing. It's rather the capacity one has to have in order to engage in any form of self-determination. 
They might ask, well, in what respect is the faculty of choice, the choosing self, something that is natural? Well, I, and we're going to be looking at this. Hegel will, will point this out. You know, the choosing self, right, I mean, is an individual who has this faculty to choose among options or ends. And if you have a choosing self, you're not bound to any particular end. The ends are not determined by the faculty of choice. They're given by other things, right? By desire, by reason, by external circumstances. You face a given array of options. You have the faculty to choose among different ends. That faculty of choice is not the product of choosing. It is something you have to already dispose of in order to make any choices. For that reason, not only are what you choose not determined by your faculty of choice, they are options that are given. Your faculty of choice simply chooses among them. It does not generate the options. By the same token, your faculty of choice does not determine the character of your own agency. You are a choosing self by nature, not by convention. But when we're talking about self-determination, we're going to be speaking about an agency that is determined by its own willing. Where in other words, if you are engaged in self-determination, you are determining yourself. You are determining your own agency. Which means the character of the agency must itself be a product of willing. Now you might ask yourself, is it possible to determine the character of your own agency if you just act as an individual relating to things? Is that at all going to be possible? Socrates was quite dumbfounded by the prospect of self-determination or self-control. In the Republic, he, he points out, how can the same individual, the same agent, the same individual, the same actor, be both agent and patient at the same time? How can one both act and be that which is acted upon? Yet that's precisely what self-determination requires. Well, it may indeed be an insurmountable problem for the self to determine itself by itself as an individual. But what if we think about individuals exercising their natural capacity of choice in relationship to one another? What if, by interacting with others, one is able to do something one can't do by simply acting with regard to things? What if, in acting with regard to others, one is able to determine oneself or to determine one another in in the interaction one engages in, in such a way that we take on a kind of agency that does not operate apart from the choices we make. Well, as we're going to see, that is going to be precisely the case of the kind of agencies that are going to turn out to be the agency <coughs> of self-determination, the most minimal being the agency of the owner. In engaging in property relations, one is going to determine oneself as an owner. And what's going to be determining oneself as an owner only by interacting in relationship to others who are doing the same. At the end of the line, and this may be in a way the most visible and perhaps most easily graspable case, we will determine ourselves as citizens by participating in political institutions of self-government, without which we can't exercise political self-determination. Yet, the institution of self-government exists in nothing other than the actions we engage in as citizens. Our actions and the coordinated choices of others as citizens are precisely what allow us to exercise this conventional role as a citizen who engages in a type of self-determination that is self-determination because we, in a sense, are determining the form of our agency which exists only insofar as we engage in the kind of activities that individuals do as participants in self-government. This may give you a clue to how when we're talking about self-determination, we are necessarily talking about 
an artificial agency, an agency whose character is determined by willing. Because in self-determination, we are determining ourselves. Not in all respects, because we have a natural self. Right? We have bodies. Admittedly, you can act upon your body, you can have a sex change operation, but you do all of this on the basis of what you are to begin with. And that you do not, that is not a product of your willing. And you can't will unless you have this, these physiological and psychological capacities. But on the basis of that, one can then enter into relations with others, whereby one can give oneself a kind of agency through the choices one makes in connection to the choices of others that allow us to take on conventional roles, conventional persona, the most minimal of which Hegel will call the person, understood as the other. And that when we're talking about self-determination and understand how self-determination alone can have normativity, we then can be concerning ourselves with thinking through what is the reality in which individuals engage in those practices that constitute the exercise of rights, or the exercise of practices in which we determine ourselves in terms of a kind of agency that is artificial, that involves an exercise of right. And another way, by the way, of speaking about rights is to speak in terms of equal opportunity. Because each right involves a certain kind of opportunity that is not a privilege, but is equal in certain respects, in different respects. And we'll have to, to explore how that is the case. Now, I should say, with regard to our readings, what, what we're going to be looking at, there are two books of Hegel that, that I'm asking you to, to read. We're going to read pretty much all of the philosophy of right proper. And we're going to be reading parts of what is here called the philosophy of mind. This book called the philosophy of mind is that part of Hegel's um, Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences that deals with what we could generally call mind. I mean, his encyclopedia is divided into three major sections, one dealing with what he calls logic, which might fit together with what other philosophers tend to call metaphysics. Then there's a discussion of nature, and then there's a discussion of mind, dealing with everything that pertains to, one could say, rational agency. And the philosophy of mind is divided into three sections. The middle section, which is called objective spirit, for reasons we'll, we'll look at later, gives an abbreviated outline of what is here presented in a fuller version. So you'll have two chances to try to make head or some sense of the argument. You know, we're going to read both the shorter statements and the longer statements, together with my efforts to remedy what I'm going to suggest are uh, failures on Hegel's part to do what he ought to be doing. And that essentially is, is, in a sense, how we're going to progress. Um, I'm going to be asking you to write three essays based on topics I'll give you. There will be no tests, no midterm, no final. Um, I will penalize you if you miss more than a certain number of classes. Let's see what I say if you miss four or more. Four or more. So come, I think you'll find it helpful to be here, um, precisely because ethics is not where philosophy ought to begin. Much has already been worked out on the part of Hegel in order for him to deal with what he's dealing with here. And he brings into play all sorts of concepts that he's argued for elsewhere, as he tells us in the preface. He's not going to discuss method, because he's really dealt with that earlier. So you have to contend with the problem that he has, a, he has concepts, categories, a somewhat technical terminology that is going to be foreign and difficult to contend with. But we'll, we'll try our best to, to make sense of it. So next time, I'd like you to read some sections here that sort of give you the general outline into how he carves up the whole arena of what he calls mind, within which what falls under the heading of the philosophy of right will fall. And then to look at some discussions in my The Just State, which are going to be speaking about the kind of argument concerning the problems of other, other modes of doing ethics that lead towards the t 
towards, in a sense, you could say the, the strategy that Hegel is pioneering. And I think it will hopefully give you a better handle on what we're going to find ourselves confronting when we leap into the text proper, the argument proper. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, okay. Yeah, good. Um, what is the relationship between the phenomenology of spirit and this philosophy of mind? Yeah. I mean, the, the, I mean I'll, I'll, I'll speak more of this next time, but the, okay. Hegel regards the phenomenology of spirit as a work that clears the way for doing philosophy without foundations. Most commentators do not take, do not pay attention to that self-understanding of Hegel. They regard it as a systematic work in its own right, telling us about all sorts of things. But what Hegel wants to do is to observe the shape of knowing that is that regards knowing as always having presuppositions, as always confronting the given. And he wants to observe it in its attempt to legitimate itself and to try to show how, in its attempt to legitimate its claims, it ends up showing that this is not uh, the framework in which all knowing is confined, that in effect it, it ends up undermining itself. In other words, if we can show that knowing that presumes that knowing always has a presuppositions cannot legitimate itself, but that clears the way for operating without presuppositions, without foundations. So it has, in a certain respect, a completely negative outcome. And it's intended to be, in that way, an introduction to what, in certain respects, needs no introduction. The science of logic? Which will be the science of logic. And why philosophy that has to be presuppositions, that can't take anything for granted, that can't have foundations, that can't make appeal to the given, is going to be characterized as a logic is something we'll, we'll, we'll discuss to some degree next time. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I'll see you on Thursday.